Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, hello. Welcome to Keswick Lecture Week 3 of Keswick Convention 2023. Lovely to have you here in the main tent. Thank you for joining online and in relays as well. It's great to see you. Very, very warm welcome from a rather damp Keswick. So great to have you here. Well done, campus, for being here. If you're here this morning, getting into the dry, I can see a thumbs up here. Delighted to have this morning Fiona Bruce MP. She's going to be speaking to us today on freedom of religion or belief and the persecuted church across the world. A little bit about Fiona. Fiona was appointed the UK Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief in 2020. And she's currently chair of the International Religious Freedom of Belief Alliance with 42 countries committed to championing freedom of religion or belief across the world. Fiona is also MP for Congleton in Cheshire and during which time her work in Parliament has included serving on the Select Committee, scrutinising distribution of UK aid and chair of the all-party parliamentary pro-life group. It's a special honour and privilege to have Fiona here. I'm going to pray and then hand over to Fiona. So let's pray together, if we may. Do not be surprised when people persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your words that remind us what it means to be your people in the world. But just as uh, they rejected you, so they will reject those who come in your name. But also think, Lord, of others across the world who are persecuted and experience hostility for their convictions. And as Fiona opens our eyes, go before her, help her to speak and point uh, to what you're doing around the world. And open our hearts, we pray. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give a warm welcome to Fiona. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to be with you all today here at Keswick. And can I thank you for being willing to listen to a politician? My uh, oldest son recently asked me if I knew where the word politics comes from. I said, hmm, no, go on, tell me. He answered, well, mum, it comes from two root words, poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking creatures. <laughs> well, please make the most of that little humour, and thank you for laughing, if at me, um, because the subject I have to talk to you about today is a very serious one. I've been asked to share with you today about freedom of religion or belief and the persecuted church across the world. Also about my work as the Prime Minister's mandate, uh, as his special envoy for freedom of religion or belief, which covers every country except the UK, but for the record, the words I will speak today will be my personal views. Before I start, a short prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for all who suffer for their faith across the world today and ask that your Holy Spirit would imbue this time we have together and inform and inspire many to pray and act for others who suffer simply on account of what they believe. Amen. Also, before I start, may I say thank you and how confident I am that your prayers will be effective. I say that because I was last on this stage several years ago when I had the privilege of working with a group of Christian members of parliament fighting to stop the assisted suicide bill, which was due to be voted on in Parliament shortly after the Keswick in 2015. Many in the national media and high-profile pro-euthanasia campaigners assumed that that bill 
would easily pass into law, that it would be voted for in Parliament. But you prayed, as did others. You contacted your MPs, and against all expectations, when it came to the vote, members of Parliament overwhelmingly voted against the introduction of assisted suicide. I want to take this opportunity to thank you. You saved thousands of lives. The Bible says the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and strong, and yours were then. And I'm confident that they will be similarly powerful and strong as I share with you the stories of some who suffer discrimination and persecution across the world today. I will share towards the end of my talk with just a few who represent the hundreds of millions who live in countries at risk of persecution and discrimination today. Right across the world, people are losing their jobs, a right to an education, homes, livelihoods, land, families, freedom, access to medical care, to food, to justice, even to life itself, simply on account of what they believe. A Christian will be killed every two hours somewhere in the world today. People are being discriminated against, threatened, marginalized, trafficked, beaten, tortured and killed, including by their own governments, the very governments who have a duty to protect their citizens' freedom of religion or belief. Let us look for a moment at the word persecution. A few people connect persecution with something that happened in biblical times, and, and that is right. We read in Acts chapter 7 how one of Jesus' followers, Stephen, was stoned for following Christ. And of course, as Christians, we follow a persecuted saviour, condemned to death on trumped-up charges by the political authorities of his own time. Other people are very aware of the horrific persecution of the Jews which took place in the Second World War, but assume that the world is a more civilized place now, that persecution is less prevalent today. I have to tell you that sadly, that understanding is wrong. Persecution is very much present in the 21st century. Indeed, it is worsening. Though in the midst of such suffering, there is hope as I shall return to later. Now the charity Open Doors, which campaigns on behalf of persecuted Christians worldwide, each year produces a world watch list. This shows the countries where Christians face the most persecution and you can see it on the screens now. This is the 2023 watch list. And the colors show uh, where there's orange color, Christians are at risk of facing very high persecution, and in the red countries, extreme levels of persecution. Now, Open Doors started this world watch list in 1993, and then there were 40 countries with these colors. Today, 30 years on, that number has nearly doubled to 76 countries. This year, Open Doors estimate that over 360 million Christians are at risk of high or extreme levels of discrimination or persecution for their faith. A substantial increase on the year before and the highest number ever. And of course, whilst a very high number of Christians are persecuted across the world, people of other faiths, and indeed atheists, people of other faiths and of no faith, are persecuted too. And the countries where this happens include, sadly, countries whose governments have signed up to Article 18 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, this was a declaration produced after the Second World War, 
when many international leaders gathered to agree in the hope that they could produce an international declaration that countries would sign up to so that never again would the world see atrocities such as those perpetrated against the Jewish people then. And you can see Article 18 here on the screen, that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, to worship, to meet with others, and to practice their faith in public and private. Religious freedom has never been more important to champion because, as I say, it has never been more at risk. Let us look across the world at what has happened in just the two and a half years since I have been appointed as the UK Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Right across the world, discrimination and persecution are increasing. One might have assumed that there's a, 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 a global trajectory towards greater religious freedom. But sadly, many countries, many regimes are becoming more authoritarian. And for a state or a ruler who seeks to control their national narrative, to impose their, their worldview, their ideology on a people, then the presence of a vocal religious group or religious groups with another loyalty is not to be tolerated. Ultimate loyalty must be to the country's leader, to the state. We saw this in communism in Central Europe. And now we see it in North Korea. Ultimate loyalty must be to the cruel regime there of Kim Jong-un. If Christians are discovered, they are either sent to labor camps where conditions are atrocious and many die, or killed on the spot, and their families will share the same fate as well. So a two-year-old child has been sentenced to life imprisonment simply because his parents owned a Bible. In the last two years too, elsewhere in Asia, we've seen a military coup take over Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. This has dramatically exacerbated the persecution of religious groups there. And too, we've seen the Taliban take over in Afghanistan, where the few Christians who remain live in fear of torture and execution, as do many other religious groups. And Iran is ruled by an increasingly strict Islamic regime where Christians may be banned from education or jobs and for women the situation is even more precarious. In China, there is the continuing imprisonment of a million and more Uyghurs. Listen to what the late Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs said about this. As a human being who believes in the sanctity of human life, I am deeply troubled by what is happening to the Uyghur Muslim population in China. As a Jew, knowing our history, the sight of people being shaven-headed, lined up, boarded onto trains, and sent to concentration camps is harrowing. And today's use of sophisticated technology facilitates mass surveillance and mass detention of believers on an unprecedented scale. And how many of you know that a million children, and this is according to the UN, have been removed recently from their homes, some as young as two, in Tibet and transported to residential centers to be alienated from their families, cultures, and beliefs. In Africa, Eritrea, and Uganda, the regimes grow increasingly authoritarian there, 
Restrictions on religious freedom increase in Tunisia and Algeria, only just across the Med. I was in Algeria there a short time ago to challenge the authorities who've closed down most of the Protestant evangelical churches. They're bringing court proceedings against church leaders. Some face prison, some face fines. And Bibles there, when I went, had been blocked from distribution, stuck on ships at port in Algiers from over a year, sent by the Bible Society. In Nigeria, thousands of Christians are being massacred yearly by a terrorist network. People in villages lie down wondering if their village will be attacked that night. In South America, Nicaragua, the church is being targeted now. Christian organizations running schools, medical centers, radio stations are being expelled. Even Mother Teresa's nuns who'd been working there for 30 years. And in Cuba, countless church leaders have left the country. Those who remain are subject to surveillance, harassment, physical attack, and arbitrary detention from their own government. Unless we thought that this was happening far away, here in Europe, the war against Ukraine has, of course, erupted. Again, since my appointment just a short time ago. And their places of worship are being deliberately targeted and destroyed because of course they are so much the heart of many communities. Church pastors are disappearing. Putin is weaponizing Orthodox Christianity politically. And in Russia itself, the pacifist Jehovah's Witnesses are being imprisoned as criminals. That is indeed sad news. But there is good news I can report. Let me tell you what the founder of Christian Solidarity Worldwide, Mervyn Thomas, says. He founded CSW 43 years ago and he's been working in this field ever since. CSW is an advocacy organization specializing in freedom of religion or belief. Initially in Eastern Europe, where, where Mervyn himself in Romania was arrested for having a list of imprisoned pastors' families on, on him. CSW now works in over 20 countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Mervyn says that he has never seen groups working on religion or belief freedom more closely working together than today. From, from grassroots activists in living in countries of the, uh, some of those I've talked of, who bring the stories of persecution out so that we can advocate for them, to faith leaders who are so important in this field, lawyers, academics, parliamentarians, and government representatives like myself. And it's these people I work with people who are seeking to live out the words in Proverbs 31, verses eight and nine, when we read, speak up for those who cannot speak, who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. Now, one of the pieces of good news I have, and you can see on your screens, I have the privilege as the UK envoy for freedom of religion or belief of working with government representatives. And if we can just go back to this, that's the one, thank you. Um, government representatives from many countries committed to working together now to challenge persecution and discrimination across the world. And this is a, a, a relatively new organization. It's only just over three years old, but already, 42 countries have joined, and to join the government itself of that country has to make a commitment to promoting and protecting freedom of religion or belief and challenging its abuses across the world, and has to appoint an envoy or an ambassador like myself. Working together, we are trying to make change happen for individuals 
and more widely. Now, let me give you an example. We're championing the cause of a young man, a Sufi Muslim called, here he is, Yaha Sharif Aminu. He's from Nigeria. His situation is that he wrote a song which a friend of his circulated on WhatsApp. This came to the attention of the state authorities and he was arrested. Without any legal representation, with no lawyer, he was brought before a court, found guilty of blasphemy and sentenced to death by hanging at the age of 90 years old. In August last year, he appealed against his case and the Court of Appeal in Nigeria dismissed his appeal against the death sentence. He's now 22, he remains in prison on death row and is appealing his case to the Supreme Court. And an international Christian organization I work with is now providing legal support, whilst at the same time, advocacy groups have organized thousands of signatures in his support. And as chair of the International Alliance, I mentioned a moment ago, I have written to the president of Nigeria seeking clemency. Please pray for Yaha and that this joint work will prove effective and could help to see the law changed in Nigeria. And on the next slide, you can see his young lawyer in the center of the picture, Kola. Please pray for Kola. And with me also on that slide is the Czech Republic ambassador on our alliance, who is our alliance's vice chair. Incidentally, among the most active government representatives on our international alliance are those from Central Europe, those who suffered under communism, those who were persecuted under the Nazis. Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Lithuania, others, and importantly, Ukraine itself. Ukraine was a founding member of our alliance. Working with these people humbles me. They know the realities of religious freedom being taken away from them. I've become aware that all too often in countries such as ours, we, we see opposing persecution as a worthy principle to, to fight for. Yet I have been humbled by the fact that for my Central European colleagues in these countries, it is much more than a principle. It is a lived reality. Many of them who suffered under the Nazis and under communism now face Putin crouching at their door. Ambassador Robert Rahak, who you see on the screen, was visited by the communist state police when he was still at school. And he was told, if you speak out once more about your beliefs, you will be taken away. And he says, I knew they meant it because I had seen the bodies taken away through the streets of Prague in black bags. And each time I see my dear Ukrainian colleague, Bodan Movshan, and the last time I was with him was here in Washington, DC. Each time I see him, as we part, I will return to London to safety, and he returns to Kiev. And we wonder whether we will ever see each other again. The last time I was with him was just last Saturday. But the good news, as I say, is that working together now, these 42 countries have, I believe, the potential to make a real difference because our collective voice, including to governments across the world, is stronger than our individual voices alone. And the next slide shows some of the work we are engaged in and I'm not going to go through it all because uh, there's so much I want to focus on in terms of talking about some of the individuals. Uh, and I want to leave time at the end to share with you some of the people I'd ask you to pray for. But I'll just touch on the first and the last on this screen. We're, we're developing, we're endeavoring to develop curriculum materials for school children so that children as young as five years old can begin to understand the importance of not discriminating against others on account 
of what they believe. And there's a pilot scheme being run in the UK, including in one school in my own constituency. And I'm very pleased to say that the head teacher there is telling me that actually children get this much more quickly than you would think. I believe that's because, and, 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 and I saw this with my own two boys when they were growing up, that there is a kind of instinctive sense of justice with children, isn't there? And so it's so encouraging. If we can create a generation who see persecuting someone, discriminating against someone, simply on account of what they believe as wrong, we might see a different world. We might see those words never again that were spoken after the Second World War and sadly haven't come into reality again. We might see it happen in their generation. And for the same reason, we're planning a 24-hour global virtual youth conference on freedom of religion or belief this October, aiming to involve a thousand youths across the world, including in countries where they're experiencing persecution. If they can catch hold of what this is about, of the global issue that this is, in the same way that they've caught hold of climate change, then these young people could create a generational shift, particularly using social media. So, our Alliance is able to help in a number of ways. We've helped in the Afghanistan crisis when one of our countries provided a plane and another the visas to fly out 193 people, members of religious minorities whose lives were at risk and I'm sure would otherwise many be dead today. And more recently, we've played a part in rescuing 63 Christians who had fled persecution from China, now starting a new life in Texas. Here they are arriving on Easter Day. Now some people ask me, how can I as a Christian advocate for those who's, with whose beliefs I clearly differ? You, you may have noticed that young Yaha is a Sufi Muslim. Well, uh, one of the reasons is that my mandate, uh, and you'll see it here from the Prime Minister, um, and I have an office in the Foreign Office, so this is on the Foreign Office website. My mandate is to defend freedom of religion or belief for all. And there is something very powerful about advocating for those with other beliefs than our own. Witness, of course, the Good Samaritan. But the answer to this question, importantly for me, is that it is precisely because I am a Christian that I am motivated in this field of work. It is precisely because I believe that every individual is created by and precious to God, made in his image with inherent human dignity worthy of respect. It's a great privilege to help people to know that in their suffering they are not forgotten even if their beliefs are different from mine. It is our common human dignity which is the thread that binds us together. I also fight each day as a Christian to defend freedom of religion or belief because if I want the freedom to share my faith, to fulfill the Great Commission which we read about at the end of Matthew, to go into all the world to teach what Jesus Christ taught us, a faith I found at the age of 27 and which gave my life meaning and purpose, then it's only right that I accord the same freedom to others. Those of us who work on freedom of religion or belief, who agree on Article 18 that everyone should have the right to this freedom, don't all agree on our beliefs. But in public life as a member of parliament now for 13 years, I am always very clear about my own Christian faith in my belief that, as Jesus said, and as we read in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. First and foremost, whatever my political views might be, I am a Christian. So it was as a Christian, for example, that I voted in Parliament against an extension of the Sunday trading laws and to protect what remains of the Sabbath in this country today, despite my government imposing a three-line whip to vote for that extension. 
Indeed, had it not been for about 20 Christian MPs similarly voting in the House of Commons then, Sundays would be a very different day in our country today. Politics might not nowadays be considered a very reputable profession, but please do encourage anyone you know of thinking of becoming an MP to come and talk with me. You can make a difference. I'm not a theologian nor an academic, though I am painfully conscious that there are some here today. My background is just as a local community lawyer who felt a calling to politics. But we are here at Keswick, so for a moment I will endeavour to speak from a faith-based perspective on why working on freedom of religion or belief to support the persecuted church is so important. I believe it is because freedom of religion or belief is a foundational value. Freedom to worship is central to the fullest expression of our humanity. It's what sets us apart from the rest of creation. It's what we're created to do in the image and likeness of God, as Genesis 1:27 says, to engage with a God who desires intimacy with his people. Living a life of worship is the way we as humans can most enjoy life and reach our full individual potential. And when governments recognize this, and the right to freedom of worship, alone or with others, the right to freedom of religion, then not just individuals, but whole communities and countries can flourish too. It's very interesting for me to observe that even those I work with who don't have this spiritual perspective often note that freedom of religion or belief benefits everyone, not, not just the believers, not just the religious, that whole countries and communities are strengthened when there is this freedom, that societies which aim to protect it are more likely to be stable, economically prosperous, better trading partners, and more resilient against violent extremists. By contrast, in places where freedom of religion or belief is denied or restricted, then the societies cannot fully develop. When people are denied an education or medical help, or even enough food to eat, or in other ways are excluded from contributing to their society, then everyone suffers. It is no coincidence, and I give this as an extreme example, that there are reports now coming out from North Korea that people are enduring near starvation. Those who created the Universal Declaration of Human Rights weren't all people of faith, some were, but they recognized that freedom of religion or belief is fundamental to other rights. And that's why the, the, the introduction, the, the, art, the first article of that declaration says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Isn't it wonderful, isn't it fascinating that a secular text like this uses such language? What we have here is a vision of the human person that is absolutely in line with the biblical vision I mentioned just a moment ago. God is not mentioned. There is no reference to image or likeness, but the core aspect of what makes us human and special is recognized. But if a society removes the freedom to follow our conscience, our beliefs, our religion, what use are other rights? What use is freedom of speech under those restrictions? or any other rights that a so-called free society relies on. Without freedom to believe or not to believe, it's hard to see how other human rights can make sense. Freedom of speech, of assembly, of movement, of expression, 
the right to equality before the law, the right to an education, privacy, family, life, and marriage. All of these are predicated and contingent upon the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and belief. That is why I say that freedom of religion or belief is of foundational value. People cannot be truly free if they are not able to live according to their beliefs. Without the existence and expression of what has long been considered a sacred inner liberty, other external rights lack grounding and legitimacy. Political, social and economic freedoms cannot coexist alongside major limitations on freedom of religion or belief. Now in a year in this country when a, a new king has been crowned, a king who during his time as Prince of Wales actively championed Forb, it's not inappropriate to reflect for a moment on how over 800 years ago by the Thames at Runnymede, our king, King Charles III's forebear, King John, adopted the Magna Carta. It was written by an archbishop inspired by the teachings of the Old Testament. And it was more covenant than social contract. Its very first clause concerned religious freedom. Incidentally, one of only four clauses that are still on the statute book today. The provisions of that early expression of religious freedom have been honored and elaborated on over the centuries. A Magna Carta is often considered to be the foundational document for our modern concept of human rights through its affirmation of equality before the law. John Roberts, an American Chief Justice, has put it like this. Magna Carta contains seeds of what we now regard as essential liberties, and those seeds have taken root. It was religious belief which conceived in our laws the love of liberty. And it is religious belief which protects that liberty still. Human rights accountability re relies heavily on active community life, not just state engagement. And active community life relies on freedom of religion. And many non-government organizations are faith-based or inspired. Freedom of religion plays an enabling right which nourishes community and relationships. And we can see this in our own national context historically as roots of religious expression have borne so much fruit. Josephine Butler's prison ministry, George Muller's care for orphans, Lord Shaftesbury's work to stop abusive child labor, Cecily Saunders' founding of the hospice movement, and of course, the work of my esteemed predecessor member of parliament, William Wilberforce, his determined advocacy to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. And it is freedom of religion or belief that is deeply personal to me too. Allow me for a moment to share a little of my own story now. I trained as a lawyer and by the age of 27, I was fortunate to have in life what a lot of people strive for all their lives. A flat in the city, a cottage in the country, a new car. I was a partner in a law firm and I was utterly, utterly miserable. Life seemed purposeless. Then one day I was looking for an assistant lawyer a young man who applied and put on his CV the following words, or very similar. I live my life for Jesus Christ and I am committed to sharing his word with others. Now I would never advise a young person to put that on a CV today. <laughs> but it attracted my attention and I employed him. And a few weeks after he started work, I thought, well, I better have a conversation with him about how he's getting on. But he had other ideas about our conversation. He told me about his Christian faith. I said, I am not good enough to be a Christian. I thought you had to earn your way to heaven. He explained to me, we can never earn our way to heaven. 
All of us have done things which fall short of the standard of goodness that would entitle us to stand in the presence of God at the end of our lives. He used the example, both of us being lawyers, of me being like the criminal in the dock, in a courtroom, guilty of of sinful actions, of, of falling short and about to be condemned, to be sentenced by a judge. But then, just as I'm about to be sentenced, Someone else in the courtroom steps up and accepts my sentence and my punishment for me. Someone else who had committed no crime, indeed had lived a sinless life, who took my punishment on the cross so that I could go free. And that, he explained, is what Jesus Christ did for me, for all of us by taking the punishment we deserve on the cross, though he had done nothing wrong. So, this young man explained, God does not condemn me for my failures, shortcomings and wrongdoings in life. All I had to do was to ask his forgiveness for them. All I had to do was to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That changed my life. Shortly after that, a client of the law firm saw me gospel singing in the city center with our church. The senior partner was told. He angrily hauled me into his office. I explained that I'd become a Christian. You know, as you are when you're a new Christian, you're very full of it. I think I told everyone in the law firm. (laughs) He said he never wanted to hear the name Jesus Christ spoken in our offices and that I had lost the respect of every person in that firm. I remember thinking, all the dignity I ever need was earned by Christ on the cross. But I knew then that my days at that law firm were numbered. And over time I left, somewhat scared as I'd been there nine years. But my life was in Christ's hands. And that was the best thing that could have happened to me. As my life took a completely different turn through Christ's leading, And I felt a somewhat surprising, if much more fulfilling, call into politics. And through politics, I've now traveled to many countries across the world, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, Nepal, Nigeria, and elsewhere, and heard firsthand of how people are abused simply on account of their beliefs. Far more abuse than the trivial reprimand that I got from my senior partner. And I want to state my heartfelt compassion and respect for all who bravely make a stand and suffer for their beliefs. Allow me to suggest a handful of individuals who you may wish to pray for, who represent so many others across the world. And the first one is is little Farah, who you've seen on the screen here. A Christian girl from Pakistan, she was aged just 12 when she was abducted by men who forced their way into her grandfather's home and kidnapped her. She was then what's called forcibly married, a terrible phrase, meaning she was serially raped by a man almost four times her age, targeted because of her faith. And some estimate, although figures are difficult to assess, that as many as a thousand young girls a year in that country could be abused in this way, this shocking manner with too little being done by those in authority to address it. During five months of sexual enslavement, young Farah was shackled during the day and forced to work long hours cleaning animal dung in her abductor's yard. She said, I was chained most of the time. It was terrible. They put chains on my ankles and tied me with a rope. I tried to cut the rope and get the chains off, but I couldn't manage it. I prayed every night saying, God, please help me. Her ankles were wounded where she was shackled. A court eventually ruled the marriage unlawful, but no action was taken against Farah's abductor. Please pray for the many girls abused in this way and that the legal systems would be improved to bring the perpetrators to justice. And I'd particularly appreciate if you'd pray for another Christian girl, Mara Shabazz, who has been similarly abused. She managed to escape her abductor, but extremists 
have been looking for her, and she's now been in hiding in one room for almost three years. She was abducted at 14, and she'll be 18 in October. A long-term solution needs to be found for Mara, who's being supported by aid to the church in need. Please pray for her. And then moving to another country, here we see Mervyn Thomas, who I mentioned earlier from CSW, along with myself, and in the middle, the mother of Leah Sharibu. In Nigeria, school children are often abducted for ransom payments to fund the very terror groups attacking their communities. And Leah was one of 113 schoolgirls kidnapped by Boko Haram in 2018. She was just 14. They were offered freedom if they recanted their Christian faith. They all did and returned home except Leah. The other girls said, Leah refused to recant her Christian faith. She still remains missing. Now I've met Leah's mother as you can see and I have never seen a face so haunted. Please pray for Rebecca and for Leah's return. Also in Nigeria, in May this year, a violent mob at a college of education stoned to death a lovely young Christian university student, Deborah Samuel, because she made remarks they considered insulting to Islam. Please pray for her family. And in Iran, here are two grandmothers, Fariba and Mavash. Not long ago, they completed 10 years sentences in the brutal Evin prison. Simply for their face, they are Baha'is. And now, this year, they've been rearrested to serve another 10 years for the same so-called crime. And here is Shamil Kamikov, a Jehovah's Witness in Tajikistan. Now, this is good news because actually, um, Shamil is one of the prisoners of conscience that our alliance is championing. And uh, I was able to write to the president of Tajikistan asking for Shamil to be released early because he was suffering extreme ill health. Others campaigned on his behalf. As I say, nothing in politics is ever done alone. But I'm pleased to say a few weeks ago, Shamil was released early, several years early, from his six and a half year prison sentence. In Somaliland, however, Hannah Abilalek, I always have struggle with some of the names, um, she's another prison we're championing. She's recently been in prison for five years simply for converting to Christianity, reported to the authorities by her own mother. Please pray for Hannah. I believe she is being put under great pressure in prison to recant her faith. And here on the next slide is Bishop Alvarez. He's been in prison to serve a 26 year sentence for speaking out from his pulpit against the human rights violations in his country, Nicaragua. If you remember, I spoke about those at the start of this presentation. Last month, he was offered his freedom in exchange for leaving his country. He refused. He is staying with, with his parishioners and his people in prison. Please pray for him. And lastly, in my all too short list of prisoners of conscience, let me tell you about Helen Behane. She's a Christian from Eritrea, imprisoned for her faith, but not in a prison as we would know it. In fact, I've, I've heard one person in Eritrea describe our prisons as hotels. He says, you have beds, <laughs> you have heating. You even have televisions. Prisons in Eritrea are cruel places. Some are merely holes in the ground and when the guards get tired, they simply stamp on the air vents. Helen was imprisoned for much of two years in a shipping container where she was almost burnt to death by the heat of the sun at noonday and frozen to death at night. Most prisoners in those containers go, go mad, many die. And when Helen's guards asked, why have you not gone mad? Why have you not died? She responded, I have the words of the Bible in my head, keeping me alive. So they tried to beat the words out of her head. Helen's so-called crime 
She's a gospel singer who sang in public about her Christian faith. The good news is that Helen, supported by Christian Solidarity Worldwide, having survived her prison term and strengthened and kept by her Christian faith, now campaigns globally on behalf of the persecuted. And the other good news is that the church is growing worldwide, even amid severe persecution. Let me share just two reports, one from Iran and one from China, two of the countries close to the top of the Open Doors World Watch list that you saw at the start of this presentation. A report from March 2023 from the underground church of Iran sets this out. Despite the risks, the underground church in Iran is thriving. Estimates suggest there are currently between 300,000 to 1 million Christians in Iran, most of whom are part of the underground church. This growth can be attributed to several factors, such as the church's strong sense of community, its innovative approach to finding ways to connect with other believers, its persistence and commitment to discipleship and training new leaders. Isn't that encouraging? And from China, Voice of the Martyrs highlighted in a recent article that there could be, wait for it, as many as 200 million Christians in China by the year 2030. And the fact that these churches exist and have grown by millions is probably the greatest revival in all history. I'm sure that some of this is because people in other countries like you are praying for them. There is so much we can all do. We can all play a part. I want to express my profound appreciation for organizations like Open Doors, Aid to the Church in Need and Christian Solidarity Worldwide who campaign for those who suffer. Without organizations like them, people would not have the information we need to advocate. And so apart from praying, another way you could help would be to support one of these organizations. As well as praying, you could perhaps consider send, signing a petition or sending a card to someone in prison for their beliefs. The encouragement from this cannot be overstated and an organization like CSW can arrange this and some of their leaflets are with me should you wish to have one. Added to the endeavors of others, your action could be a tipping point that makes all the difference in the world to one person. As Anne Power says, she's a court of appeal judge in Ireland, we have to remember that the wheels of international justice need to keep turning. And if we each put a little oil in, they will do so. And as I say, one thing I've learned in politics is that little of enduring good is achieved by an individual alone, but rather by working with others. We can all play a part. In closing, for me, the heart of freedom of religion or belief, the heart of working for those who are persecuted across the world, is based on respecting the unique worth of every created human being. It is about the importance of treating every individual with dignity. It is about saying, we are standing with you. You matter. You have purpose. You are significant wherever you are in the world. Whatever your faith or none, you are not forgotten. You are not disregarded. You are not overlooked. We will not pass by on the other side. Thank you for listening today. We've got a few minutes left, 
Um, Fiona thinks it's best, actually, rather than taking public questions, she'll be here at the front, very happy to uh, pick up with people afterwards who've got any particular questions for her. So I wonder if just for a couple of minutes, where we are, we might pray either on our own or in ones or twos, just for some of the situations she's been highlighting. You may not remember individuals, people's names, but we'd love you to turn those thoughts to prayer and also what the Lord's been saying to us as to how we, want, we might play our, our part in loving brothers and sisters and standing up for freedom of belief. Just a couple of minutes, then I'll close our time in prayer. Let's pray together. prayers to a close. Our loving God and Father, thank you for your servant Fiona. Thank you for calling her to yourself. Thank you for her courage in standing up for you. Thank you for her passion for freedom of belief across the world. Thank you for her care for those who know and love you and are called by you. Thank you for her care and love too for those of other faiths and religions too and that zeal and honor and care for them. Thank you for this alliance. Thank you for progress there. But we do cry, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Think of individuals that uh, Fiona's mentioned, but many more that I, perhaps she has not had time to mention, but you know. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And lay on our hearts what we can do that we would indeed not walk by on the other side. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And just again, Fiona, thank you so much for uh, your sharing with us. So thank you. So, so that ends our Keswick lecture. The Bible reading will be in here at 11.15. Thanks so much. God bless.
Sorry.